Good morning, Unity Point. We know that a lot of team members still have very sincere concerns about our vaccine requirement and our new policy. And so this morning, we really wanted to lean into our brand promise, which is acknowledging how much you matter to this world and letting you know you matter by taking those concerns very seriously and addressing them head on. But today's town hall is really focused on the science. Um, we will have a special conversation a week from today on breastfeeding and um, other issues around pregnancy and fertility and those trying to conceive on Friday, September 3rd. And at today's town hall, we'll really look at the science and the process of development of the vaccine. You know, this uh, session today is a chance to interact with Unity Point's top clinical experts who've been leading us through the entire uh, COVID pandemic. This is not a point and counterpoint forum. There are plenty of other forums where people are debating their views on policy, their views on individual freedom, or their views on um, other concerns. This is a place to ask your sincere questions and express your sincere fears and hear from our top clinical experts the most objective interpretation of the science that we can provide. If you do enter other types of uh, responses to the policy or responses to how we're handling this, uh, we will not be addressing those in today's session, but we did include a couple of questions in the current employee survey, the Your Vo Voice Matters survey, where you are welcome to provide that feedback and leadership will read all of those comments. I'm going to be joined this morning by Dr. Dave Williams, our Chief Clinical Officer, and he's going to introduce a panel of experts in just a moment. Um, but before we jump in, I want to take a moment to address the FDA's decision on Monday to approve the Pfizer vaccine for those who are 16 years and older. You know, this came as very welcome news. Dr. Williams and I had both gone out publicly early in the pandemic after the vaccine uh, was under emergency use authorization and had expressed that we would not issue a requirement for vaccine until it was fully licensed by the FDA. The Delta variant changed our thinking in that and caused us to revisit that. But we are very happy that the Pfizer vaccine did in fact receive full FDA licensure prior to the September 1st effective date or the November 1st full vaccination date of our vaccine requirement. Many people have been asking about why it took so long for the Pfizer vaccine to be um, fully licensed by the FDA. And I'll tell you, it's because the FDA did hold the line on their process for approval and insisted on full six month follow up data on the um, patients that were in the initial Pfizer studies. So now let's get to the questions, which are going to be the top five most commonly received questions in our COVID inbox. And after that, we'll open up for the Q&A and you're welcome to begin entering questions in the Q&A with the question chat bubble bubbles at the top right of your screen at any time. With that, let me turn the floor over to Dr. David Williams, Chief Clinical Officer. Dave. Hey, thanks, Clay, and good morning, Unity Point. Thank you so much for joining us. You have over a thousand of you in this town hall, which is outstanding. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Dave Williams. I'm a pediatrician here with Unity Point. Been here for 21 years at this point. Uh, I am joined today by four of the best and brightest, four of the smartest people I know, and four physicians who have done a tremendous job guiding us throughout this pandemic over the past uh, year and a half now. Uh, we have Dr. Marcel Devetin. Uh, Marcel is an oncologist. He is our VP Medical Director of our Clinical Leadership Group, and he leads our Clinical Specialist Group, which is the group that has uh, been answering so many of your questions about this COVID vaccination and about COVID the disease itself. Dr. Lisa Veach is joining us. Dr. Le Dr. Veach is an infectious disease physician in Des Moines. She has done wonderful work in all of her communities, either uh, being there in person or virtually via telehealth to help our physicians and providers provide great care to patients with COVID and has done extensive research and literature search on the COVID vaccine. We have Dr. Diana Kaufman, who's an ob gyn physician and the leader of our Women's Health Service Group. She's gonna be joining us this week and next week to give a little special attention and answers to our team members that are pregnant or trying to get pregnant or breastfeeding. And we have uh, my partner for 20 years, Dr. Steve Rinderneck. Steve is an awesome pediatrician and he is also the chair of our Vaccine Oversight Committee and has been doing great work with vaccines as a microbiologist by training for several years. So, you know, my hope today as we go a little deeper, 
Uh, we've talked at length about mRNA vaccines, about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, about the fact that the mRNA vaccines seem to be new, but they're really not. They've been studied for decades. They're safe. They have no risk of giving you COVID. They do not contain a live virus. They do not go into your DNA. But we've got some really good questions. And, and to start with, we kind of themed the five questions that have been most common uh, that have been emailed to Clay or myself and others. So right now, uh, let's just dig in and let's jump in with questions. Dr. Rinderneck, Steve, I'm gonna send this first one to you. And the first question is, why would you even think about requiring a vaccine that doesn't have FDA approval? Isn't this experimental? <laughs> hey, thank you, Dave. You know, that question comes up a lot and it, it makes sense because it makes a lot of people worry. What I think is important to remember is that nobody that has received this vaccine, unless they've been in a study protocol, has received an experimental vaccine. They are not experimental, all right? Let me just review a little bit for you the approval process, because I think that's an important thing to know as we kind of go forward and we watch as these vaccines develop. Vaccines have to be approved by the FDA and then recommended by the CDC. The FDA and the CDC both have independent boards, and it's important to know that those boards are not affiliated with the manufacturer. They are not affiliated with the government. They're independent. Our best scientists that we have in this country and our best public health people make decisions after they review the data, and it's shown to be safe and effective. There's two different ways a vaccine can be approved. The first is through a emergency use authorization or EUA. Uh, the requirement for that that's been set is follow up for a two month period in those study participants. The difference between that and the full licensure, which Clay said as well, full licensure requires six months of follow up. What I think is important though, now that we've been using this vaccine, you know, those studies, those involved a few tens of thousands of individuals. So we could follow them extremely closely. They were done under study protocol, so they were watched. They had diaries, they kept track of everything. It's important to do that, but really important to me now when it comes to proving safety is the fact that we have given 360, over 360 million doses in this country. And we have had a really vigorous, we've had these established safety surveillance programs in this country for decades. One of the new ones is called VSAFE, but we have others, the VAERS program, the VSD, which is a vaccine safety data link. We have active surveillance and monitoring all of these doses and how people do with them. So knowing that that surveillance is set and we've given that many millions of doses, uh, and we are finding some very slight issues that come up with some vaccines. Uh, if you look at the myocarditis with the mRNA vaccines, the clotting issues with the J&J, &J, it's pretty remarkable that when you look at something that happens between one and four cases per million, that it can be picked up this quickly. So that tells me that the rigorous nature of our surveillance is up, it's working, it's healthy. So these are not experimental vaccines. They've been, they've been proven both in study protocol and now more important to me, out in practice. Thanks, Steve, much yep. appreciated. You know, the second question I think we ought to tackle right off the bat is natural immunity, because unfortunately many of our team members and perhaps many of you had had the disease COVID. Dr. Veach, I think I'm gonna send this one to you. Why shouldn't why should we require a vaccine when somebody's had COVID? Why not just rely on their natural immunity? Yeah, good morning. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for including me in this uh, important um, uh, town hall. And and yeah, that question has been on um, uh, our minds for sure. Um, but it turns out um, that the immune response after infection is not as reliable as that after vaccination. So uh, what do I mean by that? Um, well, there's a couple of things. The immune response after infection is more variable, one person to the next. And even more importantly, it's less protective against variants and against reinfection. So how do we know that? We have both, <coughs> excuse me, laboratory studies, so measuring the immune response in the laboratory, and we also have patient studies. So in the laboratory, we know 
that um, uh, persons who um, have received the vaccine have a much higher chance of having antibodies that are active against the Delta variant and in much higher amounts, uh, up to 50 fold higher amounts. And importantly, we have a, a, pa a patient study uh, from Kentucky. <clears throat> there they looked at persons who got reinfection. And it turns out that those, or I'm sorry, they looked at, uh, yeah, they looked at persons who got reinfection and, and, found, and, and asked, were those people vaccinated or unvaccinated? And the folks who had a natural infection and did not get vaccinated were 2.3 times more likely to come down with a reinfection than folks who went ahead and got vaccinated. So getting vaccinated after infection is really very important. It provides a much stronger uh, layer of protection and that leads to a much uh, higher level of safety for you and for your loved ones and for our patients. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Dr. Devetin, I'm gonna give this one to you. And this is a question that uh, I've gotten from all nine regions in all three states. If, if we're gonna go ahead and require the COVID vaccine for our physicians and nurses and employees, why are we not requiring our visitors? Why are we not requiring our patients to be vaccinated? Thank you, Dave. Yeah, excellent question. And I think it reflects a little bit the uh, frustration that maybe some healthcare workers are feeling as they're taking care of patients on a daily basis, recognizing that uh, some of the problems that they're dealing with are largely preventable. I, I think to answer that question, I want to go back to the very fundamentals of who we are and what we do as a healthcare organization. Primarily, we are here by our own choice to provide the best possible outcome for every patient every time. And as such, we, we have a moral and an ethical obligation to provide those who are dependent on us for their health care with a safe environment. Safe environment in today's world means an environment that reduces the risk of COVID transmission to the lowest level possible. And it's very clear from all the studies that the best way to do that is through universal vaccination. Uh, as an employer, by the way, we also have a legal obligation to provide all of our healthcare employees with the safest possible environment. Uh, patients are often not seeing us out of uh, choice. They, they, uh, they need to see us. They are reliable, reliant on us uh, for their healthcare. Uh, we want to encourage them to be vaccinated as much as we can, but we obviously do have a different relationship with them than the relationship that we have with each other and that we as an employer have with all of our employees uh, uh, with that obligation to provide a safe environment. Thank you, Marcel, for that. Dr. Beach, I'm going to go back to you with this one. So unfortunately, with the Delta variant, what we're seeing is that people, even vaccinated, can continue to spread COVID if they become exposed and get COVID. So, so what's the answer to why should we require a vaccine if they still need to mask, if you still are worried that we could spread COVID? Yeah, that question certainly is, um, is of concern for a lot of folks. Um, and much of this um, related to the, the outbreak in Massachusetts, which we can certainly talk about more in detail. Um, but what's really important to, to know is that although the vaccine cannot eliminate the risk of transmission, it greatly reduces it. Um, and so again, how do we know that? We know that both from, uh, once again, laboratory or antibody studies and more importantly, we know that from, from some clinical data or patient-related data. So in a, a recent um, report, uh, investigators looked at how much live virus could be found in the respiratory secretions of persons that were infected, and they compared that in persons who were infected after vaccination, so a breakthrough infection. And it turns out they were less likely to find live virus in persons with a breakthrough infection, and that virus decreased much more rapidly than in persons who had not been vaccinated. So that would strongly suggest a lower risk of transmission. And now we know um, in a study from the Netherlands that a vaccinated person with a breakthrough infection is much less likely to spread it to their household contacts by as much as 70% lower risk. 
So those are very important um, aspects to remember that, yes, it's true, it cannot completely eliminate the risk of a breakthrough infection, but it decreases that risk. And then even if a breakthrough infection occurs, the, the chance of transmitting that to others is also reduced. Um, so those are, again, very important factors to provide that added layer of protection for ourselves, our team members, and our patients. Thanks, Lisa. Very good. Dr. Rinderneck, you hit this in your original question, but I want you to hit it again because I think it's important. COVID has obviously been around only a, a couple of years, less than a couple of years, so we don't have the long-term side effect data. What's your thoughts on requiring a vaccine without, you know, 20, 30 years of long-term data? Yeah, thanks for that, Dave. You know, when I see patients here in the office and summer is physical season for a pediatrician, so I'm seeing all those kids that are in once a year usually. Um, when I notice in their chart that they have had a COVID vaccine, I always start the conversation the same way. And I say, hey, I'm really proud of you for something. And they look at me like, what's this guy talking about? <laughs> they don't realize that the pharmacies enter data into the registry for the state and the state talks to our electronic health record. So I know that information, they don't even know that. So it's really surprising to them when I say that and they look at me, it was such a quizzical look like, what is this guy talking about? And so I say, yeah, you got your COVID vaccine. And they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I do the same thing when I notice someone has not had the COVID vaccine. At the end of the visit, I say, hey, give this COVID vaccine some thought. Do you have any questions about it? Predictably, the parent's question is, well, it just hasn't been around very long, all right? I just, I just wanna wait and see. I, I, it just hasn't quite proven itself yet. And that comes down to this question, Dave. I mean, people want time to sort this out. I let them know that, you know, in the history of vaccinology, <laughs> there, there are not side effects attributed to a vaccine that occur past that six to eight week window. The EUA required two months of post study data to review. That two months isn't a random number, okay? That two months is a time period with which vaccine side effects happen. You don't see them happen past that. So the fact that we're almost nine months out, again, over 360 million doses, we have actually followed this for a long time. So I'm comfortable from the time that we've been following the vaccines that we have and that they're still uh, proven to be very safe. So you don't have to wait months and years to determine that. That doesn't happen with vaccines. Thanks, Dave. Great answer. Thank you, Dr. Rindernack. Dr. Kaufman, let's get you involved here a little bit too. So we will have team members that will have medical exemptions. We will have team members that will have religious exemptions, and we will have team members that will defer the vaccine during pregnancy. Uh, the requirement for those team members is that they wear a surgical mask. So the obvious next question is, why can't people just wear a mask? Why do we need to require the vaccine? Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everybody. You know, I think this really gets back to what Dr. DeVetten touched on earlier. Who, this is who we are, and this is really our responsibility and what we do. We know that the vaccine provides a stronger layer of protection. And to give the highest level of patient team member safety, it really truly is our responsibility to get that vaccine. Thanks, thanks, Diana. Clay? Let's send it back to you. I think we're going to enter into the live question and answer portion. Popular topic to kick us off is around boosters. And there are lots of very specific questions in the chat related to boosters in terms of the efficacy, the timing, and the availability of team members and what that process might look like. So Dr. Williams, do you want to kick off with one of the experts in terms of just what do we know about boosters current state? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question, and I know the clinical specialist group is reviewing that right now. I think I'll start with Dr. DeVetten and Dr. Veach, Dr. Rinderneck, Dr. Kaufman, you're welcome to join in. But Marcel, can you give us a brief update or where we're at on evaluating boosters? I'll start us off and then uh, see uh, what uh, Dr. Veach and Dr. Rinderneck have uh, to add to that. So uh, first, 
definitions are important. When we say boosters, what we basically mean is a third dose of one of the mRNA vaccines or a second dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines for individuals who are already fully vaccinated, but whose immunity is now supposed to be waning to, in essence, remind the immune system to be fully active and be prepared for a possible confrontation with COVID virus. Uh, we have some data about the efficacy of those booster doses. Uh, some of the data that come from uh, 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 studies that have been performed in New York, some data that uh, the Israeli Health Department uh, has collected, uh, and then there's lots of data from laboratory studies where we simply look at antibody titers over time. All these data right now are being shared with the advisory committee of the CDC uh, for them to render a judgment and decide if they really want to uh, support the administration of those booster doses. And we fully anticipate that in the upcoming meeting of that committee, which is going to happen next week, there will be a lot of data shared, there will be a lot of discussion, and there will be a recommendation made to the CDC. Uh, based upon that recommendation, CDC and FDA will make their final decision as to whether booster doses are going to be helpful for all of us who are already fully vaccinated. And then depending on the outcome of that recommendation, uh, if it is felt that such booster doses are necessary, our policy does accommodate for the need for everybody who already has been fully vaccinated right now to receive a booster dose. And obviously we will do that in the same way that we have administered the first two doses in a way that is convenient and uh, without any charges to our employees. Anything to add, Steve or Lisa? Hey, just uh, I think again with Marcel, the definitions are extremely important with this. We heard not too long ago that it's recommended that immune compromised persons get a additional dose, right? That is not a booster dose, right? From a terminology standpoint, that's an additional dose. That means those persons likely did not respond well to their initial series. So their immunity is suppressed to the point that that initial series wasn't enough, but that third dose <clears throat> really seemed to help them significantly. So that's considered an additional dose. It's given at least 28 days from the end of their primary series. Unfortunately, right at the same time that was recommended, <clears throat> it was impossible to turn on the TV and not hear about booster doses for everybody. And I think a lot of the population got confused on this fact and they were considering those were boosters and everyone was going to get this at 28 days and it was kind of a mess. It actually made me shudder when I would hear about these booster doses because the information was coming from everyone that didn't really count. OK, I, I don't listen to what the CEO of Moderna or Pfizer has to say about booster doses. <clears throat> and frankly, I don't listen to the White House at what they have to say about booster doses. Those aren't the people that determine that. And so when we hear in the news that so and so recommends it, that's fine. That's their opinion. They may have access to data, but ultimately it does come down to the advisory committee to the CDC, which does meet next week. I'm anxious to see what that what happens there. We know that the data on efficacy of our vaccines, even with the Delta strain, is really holding strong for serious disease, <clears throat> right? It, it is. We're having the, the efficacy in all disease is a little lower. So we go from the mid 90s to the mid 80s in efficacy. Is that enough to warrant a booster dose when we have countries that have no vaccine to give anybody? To me, it's becoming an ethical issue, and I think our country will have to deal with that, and hopefully we can support what's best for our country and the world, because remember, this this is a world issue. No matter how well we protect our people, if the rest of the world's spreading this, we're getting new variants all the time. So I think our country has, a, has an ethical obligation to the rest of the world on this, and I'm glad it looks like they're gonna come through with that and protect our people as best they can. So Lisa, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, I think we are all um, um, awaiting the ACIP decision and, and their um, review of data. And by the way, those are public meetings, so you can um, attend and, and watch that very careful uh, deliberation process. Um, but I do think the database is building. 
um, to suggest that that we will likely proceed, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, with booster doses. Um, but it is so important to remember what Dr. Rinderneck mentioned, that the vaccines are holding up remarkably well to prevent serious disease and hospitalization. Uh, really some of the best uh, of a vaccine we've ever had, <clears throat> excuse me, 95% effective. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Next big topic is around understanding some of the nuances with the FDA approval. So some of the specific questions that we've gotten are, if the Pfizer vaccine is the one that's approved, if I'm someone who has gotten J&J &J or Moderna in terms of a booster, what might that look like? As well as other questions around, will that be the only one that's available for team members to receive if they're not yet vaccinated? So let's take those and then there are a couple more from there. Dr. Williams, if you want to lead there. All right, FDA approval questions team. I think I'm going to start with Dr. Beach on the FDA approval. Um, and I think I believe the specific question was we have one F fully FDA licensed vaccine, which is Pfizer. What if I had got Moderna, Johnson and Johnson? How are we going to handle uh, an eventual booster if that is the decision from the ACIP? Yeah, thanks. Um, the AC, I, uh, again, it's, I, this is conjecture because I'm, I'm not certain what they'll uh, recommend, but it's likely um, that they'll handle it much like they did with the additional dose for immunocompromised, where the recommendation was to receive the same vaccine as your initial series, but, but not to hold tightly to that. And if that is not available, then to receive what is available. And that's, again, within the mRNA um, group of vaccines. Um, there is yet no recommendation for an additional dose with the with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and um, it's possible that that if you receive the Johnson and Johnson, that they will um, again hold to that recommendation that that's the the one you should be boosted with. Um, but we just we need to to uh, um, to wait and see what the ACIP recommendations are. Thank you, Lisa. Julia, I'm going to be honest and candid and say I forgot the second part of that question. You're good. We haven't quite got there yet. So the next piece of it is can uh, several questions are coming in around the specifics related to the names of the, the products, if you will. So, you know, now we're hearing about a, a new name. We've we've talked about the Pfizer vaccine, but now it's Comirnaty or however you <laughs> pronounce it. That's probably wrong. Um, so uh, it, Based on what's been published on the FDA website, can they, are these being used interchangeably? Is one still under EUA and one is approved? There are lots of rumors about what exactly got approved and how can we understand the language of what was approved? Yeah, unfortunately, just what we didn't need was more confusion in this entire situation. And I don't know how to pronounce the name either. I've read it, but um, the Pfizer vaccine, the new brand name is going to be, I'm going to use Julia's pronunciation, Comrenati. That is equivalent. That is the same vaccine. Okay, and can you hit on the second part of the question around, because this seems to be a, um, a big rumor that is popping up around, it, it got approved in terms of FDA, or is any piece of this still under EUA? help this group understand it got approved for people 16 and older it got licensed by the fda so the pfizer vaccine now called camera something uh, can be used in children down to 12 years of age so for people 12 to 15 it's still approved for emergency use authorization but not licensed by the fda 16 and older is licensed by the fda does that hit it julia Yes, thank you. So the third part of the FDA approval piece is essentially several questions around there are still clinical trials that are occurring. So how can something be FDA approved if clinical trials are still happening? And why would our health organization require a vaccine that doesn't have five to 10 years of approval? So I know this has been touched on a little bit, but can you speak yeah, to I the think, clinical trials piece? I think Dr. Rinderneck hit that twice. Um, I don't know how to take another run at it. Steve, do you want to try again? Well, the, the clinical trials that are ongoing, we'll just take one product. Let's take Pfizer. 
there are still clinical trials being performed in that those original trial persons are being followed for two years. OK, so there is follow up that the manufacturer and the FDA CDC continue to follow on that initial group. They're also doing clinical trials at younger ages. They're looking at different dosing categories for kids um, that are younger than 12 years of age. So there are clinical trials going to establish what is the best dose in younger kids. Um, but from that standpoint, um, that's about that's about it. And each of the vaccines have that happening. So yes, there are ongoing clinical trials and there always will be. That's not going to stop. That happens with all vaccines. Great, thank you. Next question is around why now? Why, what is so different about the Delta variant in terms of transmission? And, and if we're seeing with the vaccine differences in efficacy or hospitalization rates, how do we understand why now there's a sense of urgency with variants? Let me, let me hit that first and then just to prep you, I'm gonna go um, to Drs. Kaufman, um, Drs. Rinderneck and Drs. Veach to talk about the specific things you're seeing in your practice and in our hospitals right now. But when you look back to Unity Point as a whole, seven to eight weeks ago, when I look at the number of inpatients admitted for COVID on the entire system, uh, that number was somewhere in the 20s, 22, 23. That was about the average number every day. Uh, Des Moines yesterday had 76 patients admitted, just Des Moines Methodist had 76 patients admitted with COVID. And as a health system, we had over 230 patients admitted with COVID. Uh, the Delta variant, and we're still kind of evaluating and figuring out why, is it's particularly hitting the pediatric population harder. Uh, Blank Children's Hospital has been filled with uh, RSV, which is another virus. It's starting to see uh, patients, unfortunately, with COVID as well coming in. Uh, our hospitals are extremely busy differently than with the first wave of COVID, and this is actually our fourth surge wave, but differently than the other waves, our hospitals were full with people that are sick before this wave of COVID. So we've had people that have been avoiding care because they wanted to stay as safe as they could be. They're really, really sick. And when I talked to the CMOs of all of your hospitals, even before the Delta variant became a problem, 100% of them told me, Dave, these patients are really sick. The acuity is really high. Our ICUs are filling up. Then the Delta variant kind of came crashing in on top of these already exhausted and tired caregivers. So that's kind of the big system, what we're seeing that's different and why now. Uh, the, the stakes on the ground have just changed immensely. Um, Dr. Renner, let, let, let me start with you. What are you seeing in kids that you're seeing in your office? You know, this has been a crazy respiratory season. I have never experienced a lack of respiratory illness in the middle of winter. And now here we are late summer and uh, seeing the things that we're seeing with uh, all the common cold viruses, the RSV. <clears throat> it's just been such an unpredictable year in many ways. And um, trying to figure out what's going to happen as we go forward into the resp the real respiratory season uh, to me is uh, is anybody's guess and very unpredictable. Um, just from my own experience in the community, people are gathering now. We're in big groups. Most are not wearing masks. That wasn't true a year ago. So between that, the Delta variant, um, we're gonna we're gonna have an interesting year coming up. I, <clears throat> I it's just it's such a hard thing to predict, but. Um, I think that by itself is enough to warrant why are we looking at this differently? And again, going back to the safety, now that that vaccine's proven to be safe and effective, and now we have what we've just described coming up into the respiratory season, uh, I definitely think it was a time to act on this. Dr. Kaufman, I know it's been extremely hard on your pregnant patients. What are you seeing? Well, you, you know, we only have about 25 percent of our pregnant moms nationally who have chosen to vaccinate and now is the time the cdc the american college of obstetrics and gynecology the society for maternal fetal medicine all the national women's health organizations are saying please vaccinate it's safe please be vaccinated in pregnancy throughout the country we're seeing record-breaking numbers of pregnant women being admitted to the icu 
Um, just last week, the University of Alabama published that they had 39 pregnant moms admitted with COVID. 10 are in the ICU, seven are on the vent. It's been crazy numbers. I can tell you here in my own personal practice, we've seen one of our otherwise healthy pregnant moms die. So now's the time. We know it's safe in pregnancy. We know it's safe in breastfeeding. We know if it's safe, you're trying to conceive. Please vaccinate and please stay healthy for you, for your unborn and for your other children and family at home. Thank you, Diana. Um, Lisa, anything you're seeing, particularly in the hospital setting? Yeah, I think it's um, important just to reiterate what you mentioned, Dave, about the uh, rapidly increasing numbers. Um, <clears throat> of course, we knew that was coming because this happened in Missouri and the southern states um, a little bit ahead of us. Um, and it really is mostly unvaccinated persons. So nationwide, I think the data is still 90% of those that are hospitalized are, are unvaccinated. And that is why this is the time um, to, um, to really uh, move on that need for everyone to be vaccinated. Thanks, Julia. Next question for those who are concerned about potential reports related to adverse injury or death associated with uh, the COVID vaccine or any type of COVID vaccine sites like the VAERS website. What's what's your response to that? What types of information and reporting systems should our team members be paying attention to? Steve, you're probably the best versed with the VAERS system and adverse events with vaccines. Can you kind of give us a brief rundown of that? Dr. Rinderneck, did we lose you? You might be on mute. Thank you, Dave. I would never do that. <laughs> you know, there is a vaccine adverse event reporting system is open to the public. OK, it is a great network that's been present for decades, but it's also extremely abused by people. The VAERS system does not prove causality to any degree. What it does is it triggers a signal that needs to be followed up on. All right, so the best way if you want to get information as far as those safety numbers, all right, Start your Google search with CDC, all right? If you want to look at what's the incidence of myocarditis, what's the incidence of clotting, search starting with the CDC and use that as your initial word on your Google search. Stick to cdc.gov websites and you're going to know that that data is supported by real science, all right? Um, that's that's probably the best thing I can say, Dave, because there's so many different sources and people can go so many different places on the internet and find information, um, but they will lead you in strange directions sometime and in sometimes places that you think are very real. But I do want to give a caution with looking directly at the uh, <clears throat> the VAERS system. It's not designed to prove causality. Anyone can report anything into VAERS. All right, they don't have to show that it's associated with the vaccine. Any suspicion should be reported there because that's how we find out the information. A more active surveillance system is actually the, the VSD or the vaccine safety data link. That's all that's all active. No one has to put anything in there. So what they do is they look at the diagnostic codes of all diseases. They look at the diagnostic code for administration of vaccines. This is in several different large health networks throughout the country, and it covers about 30 million people. All right, when they see that there is a increased incidence of any condition within a relatively short time after a vaccine, those get followed up on directly. All right, and so it's it's uh, there it doesn't require input from humans to enter anything. It's all a data link. That is actually a little more accurate, but that information along with VAERS, along with other reporting mechanisms, gets reviewed by the CDC regularly. So if you go to their sites, you're going to uh, you're going to end up with real data. Thanks, Steve. That's exactly what I wanted to head on um, about the VAERS process. Um, and just a heads up your camera. We lost your camera feed. Julia, next question. 
Next question is on the same topic, so Clay, this might be a good one for you, but are employers liable if a team member feels that they've experienced some type of adverse event in relationship to vaccination that's required? Yeah, um, in our in our system, HPUPH is a um, health insurance uh, product that we provide to many of our employees when, who've opted in, and we cover all vaccine related reactions through our insurance coverage. Uh, right now, at this time, employers are not specifically liable for other vaccine reactions, other than that we we fund it through our our health insurance program for those of you who are on that insurance, and all medical insurance in the United States is covering it. It is not excluded from medical insurance or, or um, disability policies or life policies. It is covered. Um, get a lot of questions about what about if I have to take time off? If you've exhausted your PTO bank, then we do provide at least eight hours of PTO addition for you per uh, vaccine dose. Um, and then we can work with human resources on specific instances beyond that. Thank you. Next question for you, Clay. There are lots of there's lots of information about whether or not health systems are receiving any type of financial incentive for requiring team members to be vaccinated. Can you help unpack the answer to that? Yeah, there's a lot of rumor out there um, that that health systems are financially incented to increase the vaccination rate, and there is absolutely zero truth to that. The only thread of inference that you could even connect is that the government does pay for the vaccine administration at about $40 per shot. And so uh, they do pay for the staffing of the vaccine pods and, and the vaccine administration and provide the vaccine for free. But there are rumors out there that there are grants for the top 100 health systems that re achieve vaccination statuses. And there's absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. Thank you. So heading back to the clinical side, a lot of questions coming in around natural immunity and why that's not enough in terms of getting vaccinated against COVID. Dr. Williams. Yeah, I know Dr. Veach has quoted some specific studies. Marcel, why don't we hand that one to you? Your thoughts on uh, natural immunity and the difference between that and vaccine? Yeah, I'll go back to the information that Dr. Veach already shared. Uh, the, the, the natural immunity clearly provides uh, some individuals with some protection against uh, the COVID virus, uh, but there are pretty good studies out there demonstrating that natural immunity uh, is likely not going to last as long and give as much protection as vaccine induced immunity. And therefore, in order to maximize uh, the uh, risk or to maximize the reduction in risk of uh, COVID transmission, vaccination clearly is the preferred option. Dr. Beach, anything you want to add? No, I, I think the uh, the information both in the laboratory and and then that clinical study from Kentucky that I mentioned is is just very convincing um, that the the risk for uh, for reinfection is greatly diminished if a person who's had natural infection um, goes ahead, <clears throat> excuse me, and receives the vaccine. I think some people are worried that they're more likely to have a, um, a more intense side effect from the vaccine. So, so I can address that. Um, there is information on that. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that there is a slightly higher chance of fatigue and chills um, and some arm discomfort, but those symptoms remain mild and they only last uh, one to two days. So there's a slightly higher chance that, that you'll experience that. But again, they remain mild and easily treatable. Um, there was no higher risk of any severe side effects um, and, and no long lasting side effects. So that's important to, to know. Thank you, Lisa. Julia, another question? Yes, next question is around the Delta variant and testing. And I think the best way to put it is, how do we know that the Delta variant is causing such an issue? Are we testing for it? it? Just how do we know that that's creating this sense of urgency and this problem right now? Yeah, it's a great question because nationally, the Delta variant is well over 90% of the COVID cases 
actually over 97%. But Dr. Veach, I'm going to go back to you with this one. So we don't test every positive patient to see if it's an alpha variant or delta variant. How do we, how do our, our public health departments determine that? Um, sure, yeah, that, that, uh, I am asked that question a lot, and, and our patients actually ask us, <clears throat> so what variant do I have? Well, um, each state um, has a process to do genomic sequencing of um, a sampling of viruses. So um, our laboratory sends actually all of our uh, samples now to the State Hygienic Laboratory here in Iowa, and then they do uh, sequencing um, of a certain percentage of those and that data, excuse me, is maintained at the state health department level. It is not fed back, excuse me, to us as clinicians because it does not impact how we treat patients. Um, so the treatment for COVID is not different if you have the alpha variant versus the delta variant, but it is very important um, uh, information for the state to follow. And the CDC has some great um, uh, graphs that can display for you how rapidly uh, increasing the uh, uh, prevalence that we have of the Delta variant. And as Dr. Dave mentioned, it is uh, well above uh, 94% now. Thanks, Lisa. Next question is um, with respect to pregnancy. So Dr. Kaufman, with the ACOG and OB boards saying that the vaccine is so important, why? Why are we allowing um, a deferral with pregnancy? And what do we do if, you know, personal OB providers are advising against it or for it? Why is there not, why, why is there mis or conflicting information here? Sure, thank you for that question. We do get it a lot. Um, I will say from the Unity Point Health Women's Health Service line, we do strongly recommend and encourage all of our pregnant patients um, to become vaccinated. Um, I will let either Dave or Clay go ahead and speak to the, um, the deferral decision. Yeah, Dave, if you let me, I'll jump in on this because this is a this is a uh, an area where our board and our administration did ask for some modification from the clinical leadership group's recommendation. Um, the science is clear. You are at much greater risk if you are pregnant of contracting COVID and interfering with your pregnancy or leading to the termination of your pregnancy, loss of your baby, than you are any demonstrated risk of pregnant women who have received the um, COVID vaccine. I'm not a clinician. I won't speak to the science. We'll have an entire town hall on that a week from today, just dealing with fertility, pregnancy, and breastfeeding issues. But I will tell you this, the clinical leadership group wanted there to be no, you know, wanted the recommendation to be unambiguous. Frankly, in our board meetings, when our board was talking about this, the idea of the increased fear in this population because of being responsible not only for yourself, but for your unborn, and the thought of someone losing their health benefits uh, with an impending delivery was not something that our board wanted to do, and they wanted us to have a deferral, not an exemption, but a deferral until after the delivery. And so this was more of a humanitarian response. The evidence-based response would have been to um, require the, the vaccination because that's really what the evidence leads to. This was a humanitarian response for that specific situation of an expecting mom not losing her benefits and her livelihood right before delivery. Dave, anything you'd like to add? No, I'm glad you tackled that. You hit it perfectly. Thank you. Next question is with breakthrough COVID, as it's been termed, there are several questions around essentially why, why get vaccinated if efficacy is being reduced by this variant? So Dr. Williams, can you and your team of leaders speak to, does any vaccine have 100% efficacy? Is that what we're looking for here? Or how do we How do we feel comfortable with the level of efficacy that is available with these vaccines? Yeah, we're not looking for 100% efficacy, and I'm going to let Dr. Rinderneck address this, but I don't want to lose the forest through the trees. The reason we are recommending vaccination is it greatly reduces severe disease. And we're talking about hospitalizations, ICU stays, mechanical ventilation, and death. So that, that is the primary reason. 
Steve, can you talk a little bit about vaccine efficacy? I can't say that this morning. You hit on it a little bit earlier, but you know, in the pediatric world, we've been dealing with this for a long time. What is a kind of routine efficacy and what do we look for? Yeah, we sure don't expect 100% efficacy in other, any other vaccine. And the one that kind of comes the closest is probably hepatitis A vaccine. But, you know, our current vaccines range anywhere. If you look at a typical influenza season, okay, that influenza vaccine will range from 40 to 60, 70% efficacy against any disease. But again, it's higher against severe disease. Other typical pediatric vaccine efficacies, uh, the measles vaccine, it's right around 97%. It's getting real high, which is good because that's an extremely infectious organism. Um, pertussis vaccine, it's around 85% effective. So there's a real variability when it comes to vaccine efficacy, but we want to, uh, if you achieve enough people vaccinated, that overcomes that barrier and that gap between your efficacy and the 100%, and you can still achieve herd immunity. Um, breakthrough infections are expected. It happened in the initial trials, it's happening now. So those are not a surprise. Fortunately, those are not the ones generally in the hospital. Um, and but one thing I did want to touch on when it came to natural immunity that was mentioned, when you have an antibody present, it gets a little confusing because we do use some measures of proof of immunity by having an antibody level. All right, I'm going to give an example of that. Uh, Chickenpox, varicella. You can prove proof of immunity by getting the appropriate vaccination series or showing proof of an antibody of a serologic test. So there is a serologic correlative protection for varicella for chickenpox. There are some other vaccine preventable diseases that we've been working with for decades that do not have a correlate of protection. So you can't say I have an antibody for whooping cough, so I don't have to get the vaccine, I'm protected. No, that's not true. There is no correlate of protection for whooping cough, and we've been looking for one for decades. We don't have a correlate of protection for COVID, for COVID disease. So it's, it's fitting in with all the others and it's being worked on very closely. So people that say, well, I've had uh, disease, I have natural antibody, I'm okay. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have that information yet. But that's, uh, that's kind of my, my take on the efficacy. We don't expect 100%, but still we can override that with enough people becoming vaccinated. Great, thank you, Steve. We have time for any more, Julia? Yes, we'll take one more. And again, lots and lots of questions in the chat. Thank you. If you'd like an individualized response, please submit while we keep it open for the next five minutes or so with your name so that we're able to get back to you. So the last question is really around trust and resources. With folks who are hesitant to get the vaccine, there is a clear lack of trust in terms of what resources are telling the truth, what organizational bodies can they rely on? There's so much information available. There's so much changing information. Dr. Williams and then perhaps Clay, how does this group know what to trust? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there, there is mountains of information out there. I think Dr. Veach and Dr. Rinderneck both hit on it when they talked about the CDC website and, and reputable web, websites. We have this group and the four physician experts that are you're seeing here contribute to this group mightily called the clinical specialist group. Uh, their job, and, and they took it with no extra pay, they didn't take it with any ulterior motives. Their job during this pandemic has been to scour the literature, to really look at the most reputable sources and try to reduce that mountain of information into the most reputable scientific information we can give and make recommendation based on that. And I know it's confusing because you guys are all seeing kind of the scientific process play out in real time. And here's what happens with the scientific process. Science is not the truth. Science is trying to discover the truth. So things change and the evidence changes. And, and what these four physicians and the clinical specialist group have been trying to do is follow the evidence and keep you up to date and safe as best they can. So. They are the group that is looking at the reputable journals and cutting through a lot of the misinformation for Clay and myself and really getting us to the right answers to keep our patients safe and to keep our team members safe. 
Clay, what would you add to that? Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, we are a health care institution and we are physician driven. When we started this conversation, one of the things we took great comfort in is that 97% of our own physicians, independent medical staff and employed UPC physicians and employed direct hospital physicians had already voluntarily gotten these vaccines. And so those that have spent the longest period of time in school, the longest period of time in practice and are following the journals and the evidence with the most informed perspective, were already 97% voluntarily vaccinated. Every major society, whether it is the American Nurses Association, the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the American College of Infection Preventionists, everyone who is out there in immunology, in virology, in medicine is calling on us to please get to 100% vaccination of our healthcare workforce. As you look across our hospitalizations, you're seeing huge numbers, 95%, 97%, of unvaccinated populations in our ICUs. And we're starting to see the death toll mount again. You know, it, it, so the evidence is very, very clear. And I know there are swirls of misinformation. So let me ask for our clinical experts who are here today, if you cited journals or studies today, would you please use our librarians to add those citations to our clinical resource on the hub so that people can see those citations for themselves? I think this is a time when, you know, trust me and verbal citations is really challenging because there's so much swirl out there. And for those who are on the town hall, the hub has a COVID-19 resource where we are keeping a sample bibliography of what our clinical specialist team is relying on as they're updating our policy. But um, I also want to move to close because we want to be respectful of time. We're at the bottom of the hour. One week from today, we're going to have a second town hall that is entirely focused on women's health, fertility, pregnancy, and breastfeeding issues. That's probably the, still the number one source of questions and confusions we get. And we invite you to um, share with your coworkers. They have the opportunity to come here. I've been reading the uh, chat throughout this or the question and answer throughout this. And I know um, several of you do feel frustrated that we haven't had a point and counterpoint or presented a counter uh, um, um, view. And this again is a chance for you to interact with our clinical experts and to understand the policy we've made. It's not a chance to debate it. As I said, we've aligned with every major medical association, medical society, and, the, and a, a huge number of U.S. health systems and the most reputable. Um, if you want to express your dissatisfaction, you want to express your positions for debate, or you want to express alternatives you want us to be considering for modifications to how we enforce policy or alternatives we provide, please use the UPH underscore COVID-19 inbox that does get routed to our clinical specialist teams and leaders who are making policy. Um, or please use the two questions at the beginning of the Your Voice Matters survey. You know, you really do matter to any point health. You do matter to this world. What I hear probably most as I round, I've been rounding this week in Waterloo, in uh, Meritor, and now here in Peoria, is while we're already so short staffed, why would we uh, put a policy in place that may cause clinicians to resign? And I'll tell you, this is what we wrung our hands with the most. And this was the thing that we really, really wrestled with. What we are convinced by the evidence is that the absenteeism from COVID infections in unprotected staff is a much bigger risk to our ability to staff and meet volumes than what we have seen in health systems enforcing a COVID vaccine requirement. We're typically seeing in uh, health systems our size with over 30,000 employees, ultimately 100 to 400 uh, staff that ultimately decide to leave the organization. We are very, very hopeful that we experience no attrition due to this policy. I know that it will not be the case. So our second hope is that it is small, that it is, it is below that 1% threshold. And we believe sincerely that our best case of, um, of serving patients through this respiratory season is to ensure the full protection of our staff with vaccines and masking.